Last week, our old friend Jenny McDermott uploaded a video where she gives her take on the stream that Blair White did with Lacey Green back at the beginning of April. Now, if you're not familiar with Jenny, she's a feminist who had a few, let's say, controversial interactions with Armored Skeptic and the whole Laughing Witch Thunderfoot situation in the past. Now, despite what you may have heard about her before, I actually quite like Jenny because she is remarkably even with her principles, unlike a lot of other feminists. And that's something respectable in and of itself, even if I personally don't agree with her views on things. What I'll be doing here is giving rebuttals to some of the points that Jenny made in her video, and right off the bat, you'll see what I mean about Jenny being very even with her principles. Because the first thing we'll be looking at are some of her criticisms of Lacey Green. Lacey Green mentions that she is not a representative of all feminism. Um, there are many different types. You know, I am a feminist, and I hold feminist opinions, but I really want to make sure that, I'm sure you already know this, Blair, but people who are observing this, feminists, non-feminists, and everyone in between, um, I am not a, I'm not a spokesperson for feminism, all right? I'm not here to like speak on behalf of feminists, on behalf of feminism, on behalf of any particular ideology. I'm here to speak for me. Um, she doesn't want to be held accountable for things that she believes because she's just talking to Blair, you know, person to person, not necessarily feminist versus, you know, anti-feminist. I'm not sure if you misspoke here, but I'll take this one at face value. So Jenny, forgive me if you meant to articulate something else. It isn't that Lacey doesn't want to be held accountable for the things that she believes, it's that Lacey doesn't want to be held accountable for the things that other people believe. This is the entire point of saying things like feminism is not a monolith. You can't hold one feminist accountable for every school of thought that exists within feminism. The same way that she can't hold Blair accountable for things that other conservatives, anti-SUWs, or anti-feminists have said either. Lacey is only responsible for Lacey's words and Lacey's actions, and Blair is only responsible for Blair's words and Blair's actions. This was definitely the right way to start this discussion off, and another point you make shows exactly why. Blair says that she dislikes that she was labeled as a Nazi at some point, and how can a trans person be a Nazi? Lacey also brushed that comment off and basically was like, have I ever called you a Nazi? People, people post stuff all over the internet about me saying things about me that I literally never said, that I literally never did, just sort of drawing, Lacey must support this because Here's what mm -hmm. these random people in this place are doing. Therefore, blah, you know, it's just like, what? Let's, yeah, I mean, let's I can, be a little more level-headed about this, you know? I can relate to you on that front, being someone who often gets associated with the word Nazi or with the mm. word fascist. Um, have so you I said Nazi fascist things? Or are they putting no. it in your mouth? No, have you ever seen me say anything Nazi from what you've watched? You might not like how Lacey responded here, but the way she responded to Blair's statement is 100% the right thing to have said. You look at her statement as her saying that she hasn't called Blair a Nazi, which isn't a bad way to interpret it, although it might not be entirely accurate. I myself interpret it as Lacey suggesting that she hasn't seen anything about Blair's content that would make her think that Blair was a Nazi. But if we were to go with your interpretation, then there's still not an issue here, because Lacey can only be held responsible for the things that Lacey herself has said or done. I do feel inclined to ask though, what exactly did you want Lacey to do? And about there being many different schools of thought in feminism. You yourself do acknowledge that there are other schools of thought in feminism, at least one in particular, that you disagree with. Now, like I've said before in other videos, there is a lot of commercial feminism. I think that a lot of what Lacey Green does is recruitment for that. I just think it is creepy and cultish because once again, you're recruiting. I mean, how religious is that to begin with? But it is our responsibility always to be more inclusive, to expand opportunity, and to always demand better of ourselves and of others. Praise the Lord. Amen. But you're kind of spreading misinformation about the cause in order to collect as many souls as you can. Okay, and again, here's the problem. Feminism is not a single movement. It's not one single cause that you can say other feminists are spreading misinformation about. Feminism is a collection of many different and sometimes conflicting ideas and frameworks that only have one thing in common. Here, I'll show you. Okay, Google, what is feminism? Feminism, the advocacy of women's rights on the basis of the equality of the sexes. See? Dictionary definition. Every feminist thinks something different about feminism and got to the point of being a feminist in their own way. But tell us more about the idea of feminists going out and proselytizing other women into becoming feminists. I just really have an issue with that. I think the way that I became a feminist is I took a history course, 
I related that to what I saw around me. I found out the facts about issues. I found out the facts about the wage gap. And the wage gap is simply the average earnings of men and women working full time. It does not count for the job and issues like that and the oppression that women see every day and the oppression that people see based on their gender. We don't live in a society where people are oppressed based on their gender. We live in a society where people are oppressed based on their socioeconomic status. The plight of men and the plight of women are two different struggles, but they're not different because society says it must be a certain way for one and a certain way for the other. They're different because men and women individually have different worldviews, different goals, and different motivations and ambitions. The way that all of these factors coalesce into the society we live in is what causes there to be issues for everyone in society. But it's also what allows for each and every person in society to have the opportunity to achieve greatness, regardless of their race, gender, age, or anything else. My issue with feminism as an idea is that it takes a look at the average plight of one group of people in society, defined by an arbitrary characteristic, and says that all of the issues in society are caused by sexism, thereby ignoring the irreducibly complex mosaic of individuals that make up a society. If it were the case that women were being oppressed because they are women, then it would not be possible for a given woman to go through the same struggles as a given man. But it is, and it happens all the time. This is how we know that gender is not the most significant factor in the majority of what goes on in our Western societies. And when you take these things and look at them through a gender-centric lens, or a race-centric lens, or a sexuality-centric lens, it completely strips you of your ability to identify and address the real issues in society. And moving on. Now, as I understand it, turfs were brought up briefly and you had a bit of an issue with that. So why don't you tell us more about it? So I would have liked to see uh, Lacey defend these TERFs, or at least explain that the term TERF was coined by right-wing conservative, mostly males, to attack feminists. Uh, no actually. The phrase TERF originates in the feminist community, and was apparently popularized by a feminist blogger by the name of TIGTOG, who as I understand it is a cis woman and the owner of the blog, finally a Feminism 101, sometime between 2006 and 2010. Basically these women that are called TERFs I've spoken to many times, and they just happen to look at transgenderism a bit differently. Um, they like to get down to brass tacks, they want to find out the specifics of it, they're not just willing to accept, oh, this person says they're a woman, okay, they're a woman, and... Oh, oh, you mean trans trenders. Yeah, no, we actually disagree with that ourselves. Blair has done several videos on people like Riley Dennis and Milo Quimby Stewart, actually. Given how feminism and social justice are now, yeah, I can imagine anyone with a brain being called a TERF over disagreeing with that. However, the kinds of people that most folks would recognize as a TERF don't just think that, do they? Lacey and Blair themselves kind of discussed a few issues that would have them labeled TERFs throughout this discussion. Um, one of which was discussing basic differences in the brains of males and females, saying that there is a difference. And that's pretty turfy because you're supposed to wave a magic wand and a trans woman is suddenly a woman and they can use the restrooms of women and they can enter women's spaces. Yeah that. That definitely fits into what people who aren't progressive ideologues recognize more as a TERF. So listen, this is an extremely complex topic, and one that, as someone who has been a trans advocate for the past 12 years, I do feel inclined to start a discussion with you about. However, I don't fully know your views on this topic, and I want to keep this brief. So... The thing you brought up about brains is actually very important when it comes to discussing trans people. As Blair and Lacey both expressed in their conversation, people who are trans tend to have brain structures and brain chemistry that more closely resemble the opposite sex than they do their biological sex, to the point where some would like to classify them as intersex on that basis alone, which is incorrect. As far as the whole trans women magically becoming women thing goes, trans folk who have physically transitioned using HRT should be considered women after 18 months or more following an HRT regimen, that is hormone replacement therapy. On the physical side of things, after a long enough period of time where estrogen is the dominant androgen in the body, it causes someone's physical properties to change. In particular, for male to female trans people, they're going to experience muscular atrophy, a radical change in the way their body stores fat, and a very rapid loss of bone density, to the point where osteoporosis becomes a very large concern for transgendered women. Now, I could go into more detail about this, but basically what happens is that at the more or less 
end of the transitioning process, a trans woman's body becomes almost entirely female except for a few areas which can't be changed. These are bone structure, chromosomes, and genitals. And on the psychological level, trans women do go from having a semi-normal male thought process to having a female thought process, because so much of the way we think is dictated by our hormones. Not what you think specifically, but the processes that go on in the brain are a direct result of your body chemistry at any given moment in time. So when you have someone who is biologically male but their body chemistry is predominantly female, they are going to wind up being nearly identical to females in this regard. After enough time of being on hormone replacement therapy, the brains of trans people will physically restructure to become nearly identical to the brains of cis women. Not only does this change occur, but it is also permanent. Like I said, there is far more to unpack on this subject, but this is what the average person will need to know. I am more than happy to engage on this topic in more depth, and I probably will in later video in fact, but we'll leave it right here for right now. So let's wrap this video up with the two things that really grinded my gears from Jenny's video. The second issue I wanted to address was their discussion on prison rape. Oh, they didn't technically talk about rape in prison, but they talked about how prisons perceive rape and how rapists and sex offenders are locked up in a different vicinity of jails because in prison, even prisoners, the people that we tend to see as the lowest, the people of the lowest morals in societies, even them, they're against rape. But the thing is, rape exists within prisons. Because we put rapists in prison. And outside of prisons, we go, ha ha, that guy's gonna get raped when he goes to jail. Like it's this hilarious thing, but they're going to eventually be the victim of sexual assault. And if we say we're against that as a society, we wouldn't find that funny in any context. No. The fact that rape is wrong and terrible is the reason why it can be funny in the first place. Let me tell you a little something about evolutionary psychology, okay? Humor is an evolutionary adaptation of primates, not just humans, but all primates. It is the mechanism that allows us primates to deal with tragedy, unlike any other animal on the planet. Because comedy is the human defense mechanism against tragedy, there is not a single thing that we find funny that isn't tragic in some way. We as a species are literally incapable of finding things funny that are not at someone or something else's expense. This is something that ancient civilizations figured out a long time ago. So yes, rape is going to be funny because it is actually a biological imperative that we are able to find anything that is tragic to also be funny. If this weren't the case, we would literally be unable to deal with stress. No amount of societal pressure or conditioning can make any form of tragedy not funny. Doesn't matter if it's rape, doesn't matter if it's murder, doesn't matter if it's robbery. If it's something tragic, we are going to find it funny because that's how we deal with stress. Third thing I wanted to address that uh, I noticed in this video is that when Blair um, was speaking about men's rights activists, um, they got on the subject because Blair was trying to do the age-old thing that everyone does on the anti-feminist side, which is to try to disprove feminism by saying they don't spend enough time discussing men's issues when feminism is about women's issues. And we acknowledge within feminism that gender roles that are enforced on people based on their gender, so men being the breadwinner, things like that, are very harmful to them and lead to things like, you know, them being uh, suicidal more often or committing suicide more often, um, becoming homeless. Those are the things like them feeling inadequate based on the fact that they can't meet the expectations of their gender. Okay, again, no. Gender roles are observed. They're not enforced on anyone who doesn't live in Saudi Arabia. Everyone in Western society is free to be whoever or whatever they want to be, as long as they have the means of achieving it. Regardless of whether that means the money or the time or the skills, you are free to do whatever you want to do as long as you're actually capable of doing it. The issues that you're bringing up have far more to do with the average traits of males than they do with society itself. The male suicide rate in large part is caused by the fact that men tend to internalize their issues, which means that we're less likely to seek help with our problems, be they financial, social, or even medical. Nowhere in society is it said that men shouldn't go to the doctor when we have a three inch wound or when we get the flu. Society in fact says the opposite. So if we naturally have trouble going to the doctor over something as trivial as the flu, when there is overwhelming societal pressure for us to go to the doctor, why wouldn't we also naturally have trouble seeking help with other problems? But Blair White's point was, well, why is it then that men rights, men's rights activists are known as uh, misogynists? 
when they're the ones speaking for men's rights? And Lacey says, well, why are they? We are celebrating the beer company in Dallas that would not count out a feminist. And now we have video proof of every man in the men's movement who told Jessica Valenti no to a blowjob. No means no, bitch! No means no, bitch! They are misogynist. They are disgusting. They're not just attacking these issues in an argumentative sense. They are very derogatory towards women. They blame women and they blame feminists for their plight, which is just what? Like having to pay child support for children that you produced? Like, I'm sorry, I don't feel bad for you about that. Okay, first off, no, they're not misogynist. Paul Elam is someone who I disagree with as far as advocacy goes because he likes to be very shocking for the sake of being shocking. And I myself don't like that method of making a point. However, Paul is free to do what he wants to do with his media. I can't really control him doing that and I don't want to control him doing that. I just personally disagree with how he does what he does. And second, yes, a lot of the issues that MRAs fight against actually were caused by feminism. For example, the Tenure Years Doctrine, which set the legal precedent that women are supposed to be the default caregivers in divorce. A lot of feminists think that this was caused by stereotypical gender roles or some other nonsense. No, this was caused by feminism. Specifically, a women's rights advocate by the name of Caroline Norton, who campaigned and worked with politicians to create the Custody of Infants Act of 1839. This created the legal standard that women should be given default custody of children of up to seven years of age, and that mothers had the right to demand total custody of a child, regardless of whether or not the father wanted to be a part of that child's life, and despite being forced out of that child's life, the father is still required to pay child support. This has been the legal standard of almost all of the West until 28 years ago. And by that, what I mean is, it is still the law in some states in the United States. And again, who do we have to thank for this? The advocacy of women's rights, otherwise known as feminism. And do I even need to mention the Duluth model, which is 100% based on feminist theory and assumes in any situation of domestic violence that the male is the perpetrator. It's been done away with in some places, but in the places that still follow the Duluth model, if a man were to reach out to the police because his wife is abusing him, he'll be thrown in jail. Seriously, Jenny, please watch Cassie J's documentary, The Red Pill. It is a great introduction into what MRAs actually believe, advocate for, and fight against. And I think you would really be able to take a lot away from it, even if you don't completely agree with what's going on. Anyways, I'm cutting this one right here. This video is more than long enough. And thank you for making it this far into what has been me ranting for the past 15 or 16 minutes. And Jenny, if you're watching up to this point, then thank you for being so willing to engage with people. I really do appreciate that about you. When that is not the case. Um, and in a lot of these debates that happen. So Jenny, how's it going? Bye. People usually with opposing ideologies um, talk a lot of shit off camera and then when they have a chance to get together and actually discuss the issues, they end up agreeing on things or saying, well, I'm not sure about that. I don't know about that. Why, 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 uh, why a Nazi? Why, why isn't he like, um, you know, a fascist or like a Maoist or something? I don't know. That's up to you to decide, I guess. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay. As we've seen with, you know, Sargon and Kevin Logan, usually turns around and ends up them giggling over things and being nice to one another because they're kind of too pussy to hit the hard questions and try to debate it out over the stuff that they talk about on a regular basis. I, I'd like to think that. I think that we disagreed and you thought I was kind of a baddie old lady and I think you're kind of a phony. <laughs> But I don't think you're an evil man. I don't either. I think you're nice. I, I appreciate your forbearance. I don't I, think you're that nice, but I don't think you're evil either. <laughs> oh, well, I appreciate that.